Awesome. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining the fourth episode of Focus On. I'm Retro, a contributor with the Sustainable Ecosystem Scaling Core Unit at MakerDAO. And today I'm co-hosting our session with SES team lead, Wilder Campman. Uh, for this episode, we are joined by the team from the Real World Finance Core Unit, facilitator Will Remmer, and contributors Christian Peterson and Eric Rapp. Uh, we also have Project Real World Sandbox author Luca Prosperi on the call with us today, and together we'll be discussing the newly proposed methodologies for reviewing MIP6 applications for structured finance transactions. Uh, that's a mouthful, and I'll leave it up to the uh, pros here on the call to uh, explain uh, what we're getting into today. So gentlemen, please take it away. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so my my okay. name is. <laughs> uh, how do I so, get this? Um, uh, there we go. Sorry. Yeah. So my name is uh, Christian Peterson. Uh, I'm a lawyer with 25 years of structured finance experience, uh, representing both borrowers and lenders, mostly in the project finance space. Was 15 years in uh, international law firms with rotations in Washington, Hong Kong, and Tokyo. Last 10 years, I've uh, been working in house. And I've had the uh, privilege of working on transactions in over 40 different countries. And in and, and that time, I've, I've kind of pretty much seen everything. I believe I'm the clown with the blue pants. So over to you, Eric. Hi, um, I've been in specialty finance, I don't know, 20 plus years, you know, probably about 15 has been in the ABS investing and structured finance areas. Um, in terms of specifics, you know, I was in the great, uh, through the great crisis, I was a for, Fortress Investment Group. You saw a lot of different structures. I, I rated ABS structures at DBRS, including on deck, which I think was the first FinTech deal uh, investment grade rated in the space. And recently I've been more focused on building fast growing FinTech businesses and now the DeFi uh, rabbit hole. So next slide. So just to give you a, a brief outline of the presentation, we're gonna define what structured finance is, give a definition of securitization, really discuss the methodology and the underlying principles of the methodology that we published uh, in mid-January, January 17th specifically, uh, to go through the various key aspects of that method methodology. And then there's just some uh, backup information about uh, reviewing originators and servicers. So next slide. So what, what is structured finance? A structured finance is a form of debt financing where the lender primarily relies on the cash flows generated by a pool of homogeneous assets to repay the debt obligations. It's not a corporate loan. And the key is that it is dependent entirely and exclusively on the cash flows generated by the pool of those assets. So securitization is a form of structured finance where a group of financial assets are pooled and securities are issued representing the interests in the pool. Typically, the securities are issued as bonds for credit investors. Project finance is another form of structured finance, where in this case, the revenues of a specific project, whether it be a solar project, a nuclear project, a toll road, wastewater treatment plant, what have you, are the exclusive source of debt repayment. So in that particular case, the lenders are looking at the project as the sole source of repayment. They're not looking to the corporation. So it's not a loan to Disney Corporation or Amazon where you're just looking at the, the corporation as a whole. Here you're looking at the specific project. On the left side of the slide, you know, there's all sorts of different types of assets that you can finance in a structured finance form. You can do equipment leases, you can do accounts receivable, you can do uh, mortgage-backed securities, both commercial mortgage-backed securities, residential mortgage-backed securities. You can do auto loans, credit card receivables, trade receivables, you know, really a whole host of different assets can be securitized and financed. Next slide. So what is securitization? The, the primary goal of securitization is to legally separate the pool of assets and their associated cash flow and contractual rights from the asset seller or originator. And we spend a lot of time focusing on, on this process. Here, the seller or the asset originator, their assets are transferred to a legally separate entity, basically isolating that SPV, that separate entity, from the risks and liabilities of the seller. The SPV then issues bonds that are backed by the cash flows and the credit strength of the assets in the SPV. So again, securitization enables the seller and originator to raise funds based on the credit profile of the asset pool alone, 
as opposed to the credit profile of the seller and originator. And because we are dependent on the credit profile of the asset pool itself, that's why we need to separate it because you'll, you'll, as we'll see in a few moments, you know, our biggest concern is bankruptcy risk and assuring that we are segregating and separating the assets from the originator. So next slide. Christian, let, can I jump in one sec? I just want to say securitization helps you focus the credit profile of the assets as, as opposed to the borrower's corporate credit, because typically it's going to be cheaper to go to the asset pool, but there are still links. Um, for one, the borrower uh, is the originator is often the uh, servicer, you know, so if the pool of auto loans, they have to, you know, collect these auto loans. So there's still going to be connections to the servicing entity. You know, there typically be financial health covenants around the servicer because the servicer gets in trouble, you know, your asset pool, i.e. your collateral is at risk. And then also if it's particularly if it's an, uh, a revolving credit deal, say think of a credit card deal where people don't just have a one time pool and then it winds down. The uh, originator keeps putting in new assets. You know, when people use their credit card, it'll get put in the, the trust. Again, there's going to be uh, more concern around the ongoing originator, you know, that they have enough liquidity and they're running well because you don't want them to get in financial trouble and start putting in dodgy um, assets into your trust. So again, you're primarily going to the assets in the trust, but don't think there's an absolute lack of connection, you know, to the servicing and originating entities. There's definitely still going to be some things there. And it'll be particularly more for kind of smaller first time originators. If JP Morgan Chase wants to securitize its auto loan book, you know, there is $2 trillion single A rented entity. There's not going to be as much connection to their overall performance. But, you know, first time guys out of the gate, you know, don't expect you can say it's in the asset pool. You know, you can't look at my corporate entity. You know, typically they're going to until you're really, really solid. So, uh, next slide. Right. right. There we go. Okay. So what, what, what is this methodology for reviewing structured finance proposals? Well, you know, we've come, maker communities come a long way from a, a number of proof of concept uh, proposals, MIP6 applications that come in, have come in. And our goal and objective now, as we understand the desire of the community is to really scale up. Well, scaling up brings risks. And when we said, well, we're gonna scale up, we had a lot of people saying, well, you know, well, how are you going to be reviewing applications? What are the standards? So we wanted to publish a methodology that basically set forth standards for reviewing structured finance proposals. Most importantly, we, we, want, to, we want to avoid the situation, as you can see on the right-hand side, where maker is given a bomb and that bomb explodes, that bomb being collateral that's bad, collateral that's not able to be repaid, collateral that we have to go take action on because at the end of the day that's going to impact the sur surplus buffer so what do we do to minimize the risk of uh, of this process so you know first we had to identify well what is it that maker prefers there is a range of assets out there in the world you can have you know there's, there's just a range what we said is okay if we're putting billions of dollars through the, the maker protocol, we should try to target the highest quality um, assets and the highest quality uh, borrowers. And we want to make sure that maker is in a position as a senior secured lender. So in the event that there is a problem, it has the ability to re recover as much on what it's recover as much as possible on what it has lent. We wanted to begin to develop a benchmark with comparable investment grade transactions so that we had something that we could look at when a MIP6 application came in. We said, okay, you know, what are the standards? How do we want to look at them and make sure that we were very transparent as to what those benchmarks are. We would then go through a due diligence process and highlight, compare a particular application against those benchmarks and identify and highlight material weaknesses. We kind of asked the question, could this be, could this MIP6 application be financed in the real world? If not, why? You know, what is it that's you know, driving this particular applicant to come to the maker protocol? Is it because they're not able to obtain financing? Should that be a red flag for us? You know, why are they not able to get financing in the real world? Um, and then we also wanted to just make sure we understood and assessed the risk and the expected return and the proposed transaction for maker. 
most importantly, including the ability of the, the uh, underlying assets to timely pay interest and principal. As Eric is often quoted as saying, you know, lending out money is easy, getting repaid is hard. And we wanna make sure that we create as robust a structure so that maker gets repaid and that the assets that are brought on, um, you know, perform, and then we can continue to build the business. Christian, let, let me jump on one point you, you already talked about a bit about how would this proposal be financed in the real world? I mean, we're typically going to look for relevant benchmarks, not that it has to be done the same way, but the real world, you know, has typically already found a way. How do they uh, view the risk? How do they manage the risk? How do they structure the risk and how do they price the risk? And so we're going to look to that, you know, it, it is a starting point typically on discussions. And, you know, there could be reasons, you know, why, why the real world is missing something. We're definitely open, but we're typically going to expect those to be thoughtfully addressed. You know, if the real world typically wants a certain structure with a certain level of controls and protections for makers, the senior, for a senior lender, and someone comes in and says, well, you know, I don't want to give you those rights and protections. We're going to say, well, explain to us why we should not have the typical rights and protections a senior lender in the real world would have. You know, and we, and we can have a, you know, a thoughtful discussion. But you know we don't want to be giving away rights and protections, you know, uh, without good compelling reasons. And um, it's Luca here. If I can add just one thing uh, on top of what Christian and Eric just said, Maker has is an ambitious project, right? Incredibly ambitious, and wants to become the most commonly used decentralized currency in the world which means that when the maker wants to grow uh, a lot and financing many, many tens of billions of real world assets and maker is a DAO, so has a decentralized governance model. That means that we need to be extremely uh, careful and cautious in the way we structure our exposure because we want maker to be as passive as possible and allow an ecosystem on the back of it to develop uh, in the most appropriate way. That's also why we are happy to be ex extra careful because we can scale. We don't have an issue uh, in available liquidity, but we, we are not a small nimble hedge fund. So we want to be as remote and as passive as possible, meaning that most of the risks should be covered by the structure that we use, not by how smart we are in dealing with the risks when they arise. Shall okay. we, Christian? Yes, please. Next slide. Uh, wait, did I go too far? Uh... It's all right. We can, we can go here. Right. <laughs> so, um, so what, what, looking, what, what is it that we do? So one of the things we do is we um, look to seek support from professional legal intermediaries experienced in particular market sectors and jurisdictions. So for instance, in the SOCGEN uh, transaction, we have external counsel uh, advising us. Um, oh and that's all right. So we um, wanna make sure that we are benchmarking transactions against customary and market practice that's looking at the economics of a particular transaction, the commercial risks associated with a particular transaction, as well as the legal risks. Okay. Uh, go to go to view. I'm sorry about this, folks. Um, there you go. Um, view slideshow. There you go. There, there we go. Okay. Um, we also want to innovate, right? So, I mean, Eric and I are here because we want to be able to innovate but we wanna be able to innovate in collaboration with existing mar market practice. And what that means basically in, in my mind is that you know, there has been centuries of lessons learned in banking and we shouldn't just throw those lessons learned out because there is a, you know, a, a, a new technology or a new process. The new technology and the new process is important but it may not address all of the issues in a securitization or in a structured financing. So we want to you know, use the Legos that we have and build on and replace perhaps some of the infrastructure that we have, but not necessarily just throw out the baby with the bathwater and say, well, you know, everything that traditional finance has done for the last 700, 800 years 
it is you know totally useless. We want to we want to build upon that using the new technologies that we have. Uh, next slide. Okay, it's just a high level, uh, very simplified transaction structure. Um, you you start off with a asset originator who has you know, Citibank, what have you, who's you know, has credit card receivables from you know people like me that use my Citibank card, my daughter that uses her Citibank card. You know, we have an obligation to pay Citibank at the end of the month. That is a receivable. Citibank packages all those up into an asset pool, and transfers that asset that collection of receivables to a special purpose company pursuant to a true sale. And it's that true sale that separates the underlying assets from Citibank, such that if Citibank has a financial issue, the SPV itself owns the underlying assets. The underlying, um, the SPV basically is, a, is an entity that doesn't really have a you know, it's got a little bit of a brain, it's got a heart, but it doesn't do a whole lot other than sit and collect money and then redistribute funds to the senior debt and the junior debt. So as a consequence, often the case, the SPV issuer is managed by a, a trustee. This can be a Delaware statutory trust. There's perhaps an indentured trust that sits on top of that, that, that kind of does administration. That's particular to the US and other jurisdictions, they have other, other formats and formulas. But basically the SPV is bankruptcy remote from the asset originator and the SPV can't really do anything. It, its purpose is limited. It, it, it doesn't have the wide ranging corporate authorities that a, you know, a typical corporation would, would have. So work, working back to the left-hand side, um, you have somebody called the asset servicer. Often the asset servicer and the asset originator are actually the same person. Because the SPV issuer doesn't actually do anything other than collect money, the SPV issuer needs somebody to go out and service the accounts receivable, service the mortgage loan, service whatever that particular asset pool, pool is. Um, typically the obligors, depending on the assets, the, the obligors under, you know, in the asset pool will uh, direct the cash to a, a, a lockbox, a safe that you have there at the bottom. And from a, from a structured finance standpoint, whether it's securitization or project finance, cash is king and control of the cash is essential because remember the fundamental premise is we only get repaid from cash. That's, that, that is our sole source of revenue from those assets. So we wanna know where every single penny is going, how it's getting spent, when it's getting spent, to whom it's getting spent. And we wanna make sure that there's no leakage throughout the system because ultimately the notes need to get paid back. So once the SPV issuer has cash and is able to repay the debt, there is then a cash waterfall and very simple cash waterfall here. The senior debt gets paid first, the junior debt pay gets paid next, and then finally the equity gets paid out. So we will be coming back to this slide uh, kind of throughout the presentation, but this is a very simplified version, simplified schematic of how a securitization will work. Next slide. Okay, the key thing for us is to avoid bankruptcy because if the asset originator goes into bankruptcy and the underlying assets are still on the books as an asset of the asset originator, that basically means the SPV gets trapped into the bankruptcy estate of the asset originator. Now, each jurisdiction has different bankruptcy laws. In the US, this come, may come as a surprise to many non-Americans, but the US bankruptcy code is actually very, very debtor friendly. Whereas most uh, jurisdictions, for instance, on, on the European continent are much more creditor friendly. So the, the goal here is really to avoid the bankruptcy of the asset originator to avoid the um, substantive consolidation of the SPV in the bankruptcy estate of the asset originator. Doing so, and to do so, we need to demonstrate that the SPV is separate from the asset originator. Having a trustee actually run and operate the SPV is one way of doing it. Having, if the SPV is not a, a, a trust itself, it can, be, it can be an LLC. Having independent directors um, that, are required to make certain decisions uh, for the SPV. But again, making 
it's little things like the SPV's accounts, books and accounts are separated from the asset originator. This SPV needs to look and smell and sound like it is a separate entity from the, S the asset originator. We want to make sure that the SPV has limits on its powers and authorities. We don't want we don't want the SPV to be caught into the bankruptcy of the asset originator, but we also don't want the SPV to go bankrupt itself. So we want to make sure that the SPV's powers and authorities are very limited and, and controlled. And then finally, as I mentioned earlier, we want to make sure we understand where the cash is going so that we can avoid any leakage. Uh, next slide. So Maker has a number of other specific issues that we struggle with. Um, first of all, how does MakerDAO interact in the real world when the protocol is not a legal person? That's fundamentally a big challenge. Um, second, how does Maker sign agreements? It can't, it's not a legal person. It has no ability to sign agreements. How, can, how does Maker make decisions? Um, what decisions does Maker want to make? Um, Loans require active administration. It's not like you lend. It's not like crypto where you can you know, put, put your crypto in a vault and you know, over collateral, you're either under collateralized or over collateralized. You're under collateralized, you're liquidated, the end of story. You know, lo loans require administration. Loans require lend, you know, borrowers coming to lenders and say, oh, gee, you know, I'm going to be late on my financial statements this month. You know, please don't put me in default. Oh, mm -hmm. by the way, you know, I forgot to make this filing. Um, you know, I'm going to be late. Uh, oh, can I get a waiver on this provision for this particular, you know, transaction? There's all sorts of decisions that need to be made in administration of a loan. Um, independent third parties, typically like trustees, don't like to exercise commercial discretion. Uh, trustees are dumb switches. They just do what they're told. I mean, they, they don't exercise commercial discretion. So the question is, who does? So moving on to the next slide. Um, so, you know, one of the things we are, we are currently working on is, is trying to identify and come to an alignment on how decisions are made in the maker community. Um, and like I said, there's, there's a number of different decisions that need to be made. Um, there's different processes that need to happen. For instance, you know, pay, repayment of, of the debt is one process. Uh, you may want an independent, reputable third party to hold and take direction in respect of assets that are pledged. So if there's an event of default and we want to exercise our rights as a secured lender, who do we tell? How, you know, how, how, how do we go about telling this person to yeah, you've, you, our, our debt is $100, you're able to sell the assets for $75. Yeah, that's a good deal. Go ahead and sell the assets. You know, most parties, independent third parties are not going to want to make a commercial dis determination that 75 is a good number. They're going to want to be, be told by somebody that 75 is a good number. Um, and then, you know, what do we do when, when there's defaults? Um, you know, do we immediately accelerate the loan? Do we, how do we uh, file claims? What if we have to go to court to pursue, to pursue a claim? All of those things we need to work through. And, and you know, th these are just some of the, the challenges because Maker is not a legal person. And it's, you know, it's a community driven entity, which is great. It just makes this kind of integration part a bit more challenging. Uh, next slide. Over to you, Eric. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Christian. So I'm going to go through a number of the other areas uh, on the uh, asset manager review. And so well, what areas am I going to cover? You know, Christian has done legally, the legal review very thoughtfully. We're going to talk about ownership and management um, you know, underneath the asset manager review. So people want to manage assets on our behalf. What are we going to look at? Uh, ownership and management, their alignment with maker, uh, and that they have sufficient personnel, policies, infrastructure, and key areas, you know, things like investing, sourcing, risk management, et cetera. So I'm going to just go and flip through some of these. And I'm not going to necessarily say everything, you know, on the list. We sent out that 12-page um, description before, but I, I want to flag stuff that I think we really, we really focus on typically, you know, and just want people to understand how we're thinking about it. If you have questions as, as I go, please, please say so. So first, owner and manage, ownership and management. 
Uh, you know, we typically are going to want to understand the over, you know, ownership structure. You know, who are the investors? You know, how do they control it? You know, how do they provide oversight to management around setting goals and strategy? You know, how is you know their governance done? You know, because all of these things can have an impact on on the lender. You know, if they don't run their business ownership business well, we could suffer. Then you know, in management, what are we going to look at? You know, kind of the roles and responsibilities. You know, do they have the right people to cover? You know, uh, the business. Uh, you know, what's their experience and track record, you know, with the assets they want to work in. You know, and typically in the investing world, you like to see guys who've already done it before, you know, and have an existing track record. That's typically one of the best predictors of how they're going to do with the assets in the future. Um, we also like to see management teams that have some experience working together before, you know, often with new management teams that haven't worked together. They can be very experienced guys separately, but you know, until you kind of work together, there can be hiccups and disagreements about who's doing what, and you often will see fallout, um, you know, with these really star management teams put together, but they've never actually worked together. Alignment. Oh boy, th th this is, this is a big one. Um, you know, at the end of the day, we're kind of a dumb senior lender, you know, we're taking risk, but we don't really, we don't see the underlying loans people are doing. We don't see that the managers are, you know, doing a good job overseeing it. We don't see the collectors. We don't see 99% of what's going on. So at the end of the day, you know, we want to have um, managers under us that are very aligned with our interests, you know, because we need them to do the right thing. You know, we're not there and we're not going to see a lot of the actions, you know, so how do we typically think about this? One, we like to see that uh, management, you know, has invested meaningful amounts of, you know, their own capital, meaningful to them, you know, in a transaction. So, you know, if things go bad, they're going to feel it. Um, Again, being a senior secured lender, we like to, uh, not to be in the first loss position, i.e. we want someone else to be in the first loss position. You know, there could be like 15% capital under us. You know, so if things go wrong, we don't feel it for a good while. You know, we typically want to structure in a way that we won't feel it. You know, if you think about this, who should be in the first loss? Typically the people that have the most, um, the most insight and abilities to manage you know, the assets, you know, the managers, the originators. You know, the guys who uh, put on the risk and manage it, they should be in the best position you know, to do a good job. And thus, it makes the most sense that they hold a you know, meaningful first loss position. Uh, we're also quite focused on disclosure of all potential conflicts of interests, you know, particularly around management and ownership. You know, uh, are there any little you know, insider connections, financial connections we don't understand? You know, we, we're uh, like for some of the projects, I, mean, I think it's important that Maker can work with the community members, but we want to understand, you know, if your investors are from the community, you know, and have a sizable vote in approving this project, you know, I think that's something the community should see. And then if there are going to be some third party transactions, you know, done, we want to see them all done at arm's length, fair market value. You know, again, this is really around alignment. When we're lending to someone, we want to make sure, you know, they're operating kind of in the best practices and ethics. You know, we, we don't want them to be taking our loan and using it in kind of clever ways to make you know, unfair deals with their affiliates. All right, how do we think about the key functions you know, in the asset manager? Well, first we have to think both at the fund level, you know, if they're doing multiple um, investment strategies or just different deals and putting them all together at a fund. So we think about what are they doing at the fund level? And then we also have to think, what are they doing at the individual investment level? You know, so one manager may, can maybe have three different auto um, auto loan you know facilities with three different auto companies. Um, so we, we have to understand you know who are the key personnel. We're going to put a, you know a lot of emphasis in that uh, making the investment decisions. What are the underwriting and fund guidelines both for the fund? You know, so how do they think about risk at the fund level, which is ultimately where we are exposed at, and then also how do they underwrite individual investments? This is a big deal. Um, and then also, what's their investment process? You know, how do they make decisions? So they've got these guidelines and underwriting policy, but how does it actually happen? You know, we want to kind of see how the sausage is made in the factory, so to speak. You know, this is again where it's easiest to get comfortable with managers who have, you know, some track record and have been doing it for a while so that we can see, you know, here's the deals they did in the last five years. Here's the winners, here's the losers. And you have a much better idea you know, of how they view um, structure and manage risk. Um, not surprisingly, you know, we care a lot about portfolio management. So think once the deal, once they made a loan to, uh, to some company or a group of investments, um, you know, how do, they, uh, how do they oversee it? How do they monitor their investments? Um, 
how do they uh, manage this kind of a conflict of interest typically between the guys doing the front end of the investments who maybe get a little emotionally attached to their deals as you should versus uh, the guys who manage the existing investments already. And so if it goes, something goes bad, it's often easier for someone and more as an asset manager who didn't do the deal to say, hey, we've got a problem here, we got to do something. So we want to understand that. Uh, we want to understand how you know you manage the underlying originators and servicers and given deals. You know, uh, if you're doing like uh, facilities to auto loan companies, you know, uh, how how are they originating the loans? How are they servicing the loans? Uh, and then finally, I mean, this isn't the only thing, but we want to understand how you manage distress situations. You know, anyone in the business for a while is going to have problems. You know, it's, it's happened. It's a probabil probabilistic game, so it, it's expected. But we just want to understand you know, how you recognize it and then how you work through it. You know, getting a good recovery, you know, is often dependent on people who are willing to admit there's a problem early, you know, then work hard to resolve it. Sorry. Ah. All right, um, asset manager, then where's some more functions? Sourcing, you know, this is a big one, particularly in competitive markets. You know, so where do you get your deals? You know, rarely are you out there, you know, and you're the only lender in this space, if it's a good space. Um, so, so who's out there, you know, who are your guys sourcing deals? What's your strategy? You know, how do you deal with competition? What's, you know, uh, uh, how are the competitors playing? You know, so, um, and then roughly we like to see the pipeline where it's just kind of a funnel. We get a sense of how many deals you might see a year, how many make it past the first meeting, you know, make it into term sheet. You know, at the end of the day, there's just a big funnel, you know, and we want to understand how it works through. And then the other one on this sheet, technology, maybe not as sexy in the investing world, but very important. You know, at the end of the day, there's tons of information in, in an investment shop. You know, how, how do you manage it all? You know, what are your systems? How do you keep track of your data? Um, how do you protect privacy and security? This is a big one regardless, but if say you're doing deals with uh, like consumer lending, I mean, you know, there's a lot of very serious laws about breach of privacy and consumer lending. You know, so we, we We've got to make sure we understand that risk is, is uh, well protected. And then, you know, again, kind of a backup, you know, if things go down, you know, you, you know how do you manage a, a, a technology uh, speed bump? So it's a speed bump and not a cliff. Okay. Risk management. Again, th this is another big one. You know, you don't want the alligator to bite you. So, you know, who's doing it? Uh, you know, you have guys that are experienced. What's their role? And again, uh, what's their reporting lines? You, you know, and you want some independence. You don't want all the investment guys uh, running the risk management because in a sense, they've already done the deals and then there's not an independence. Uh, and we're also be, uh, particularly interested in how, how do they price and value existing deals? You know, how are things carried on the books? Uh, do, do, you know, the marks or prices tend to uh, reflect you know, accurately, you know, the risk in the investments, you know, in current situations. You know, you've seen a lot of kind of private equity firms and at times illiquid hedge funds get in trouble around kind of having illiquid investments and then not wanting to write it to where it ought to be. And it's hard to tell sometimes. Um, then reporting, another big, big one. You know, at the end of the day, you know, we can only uh, be uh, proactive based on the information we see. So you want to see good reporting at the fund level, you know, for all the different investments. And then, at, you know, each individual uh, investment. And we want to understand not only what do you report to us, but how do you report it to yourself? You know, because if, if you're going to be proactive, you know, in managing your book, you need to be getting good information on your investments. So we want to understand how that works. So there's a lot of it's going to be the frequency, accuracy, and timing, kind of the big three here. Um, and then kind of related to this around reporting, you know, we want to understand kind of the daily or the detailed remittances. So how are your different investments dealing with their cash and how do you deal with the cash? You know, at the end of the day, as Christian said, cash control is a big deal because being a senior lender, you know, that's that's one of our primary, uh, uh, what do you call it, protections, that collateral, that cash. You know, so we want to see businesses that run a, you know, a very tight shop around their cash, you know, and, and can track it very carefully. Let's see. How are we doing on time? Let me take a look here. Okay. Not at time. <laughs> um, and it's, uh, let me have a few more functions here and then we'll move on to the next section. Audit and quality control. This hey, is Eric. Actually, yeah. I, I got unmuted, so I wasn't sure if, if someone wanted me to ask the question. Sure. Uh, well, hey, Chris, uh, Christian, thanks for the comment. And this is the, the heart of this question in chat is, is really around 
and I struggle with it myself as being a facilitator of CES, is that how much am I in, 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 in the way, I shouldn't say the way, um, how much am, do I have interaction inside of what I'm doing versus facilitating and enabling others to do the work? So for example, there are a lot of qualified third parties that can evaluate deals. You know, big investment houses that do this for a living. And so are we, is our thinking more on the side of, are we planning to touch most of the deals and dig into all the, the minutia and, and detail so we understand it or get qualified third parties to do that for us and then to the community say, hey, we've done the due diligence, here's the work, and we just wanna make sure that you're informed that we believe it's this type of deal. I'd say, I think we're leaning towards the second, definitely. You know, so trying to look at, uh, say, asset managers who have, you know, big existing diverse books of assets, and we could be a senior lender, you know, against their $500 million book, you know, that has 18 different uh, diverse investments in it. So then we more just have to understand how they do their individual investing. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so that, that's much more scalable, and it much more fits kind of our passive, um, you know, our, our passive decentralized model. Robert, can, I, can, I, individual investments. can I add one, one thing on this? Um, sure. So, um, obviously, I agree with Eric, but I think it's, it's, it's an, the, easy, the easy comparison is with, uh, at least I always make, is with the um, central banking system. So, you have a central bank on the top of everything that is using commercial banks as intermediaries to distribute lending across the economy. So the, the, the central bank will score you as a bank to give you a license and operate your bank and interact with the ultimate borrowers. But then the bank has within certain parameters, the bank has freedom to behave the way they see fit because they have skin in the game and they're running a business and hopefully their incentives are aligned. When the incentives are not aligned or when the bank is not um, is not uh, compliant with the requirements, then the license gets pulled. And for the same reason, if you are two, if you are two people with no experience and you're trying to get a greenfield banking application at the Fed, it's going to be difficult for you to get that. And I think it's a good it's, it's a good comparison because if if we want to scale scale our footprint in the real world, we need to work with big counterparties. Yeah. Uh, and we want to have an arm's length relationship where they, we monitor their business practices and we monitor that what you're doing is consistent with the mandate we think they should have. But then we, we, we should give them freedom within this mandate to, to, do, to run the business the way they see fit. Thanks, Luca. I appreciate that. Great. And I, I, I just skipped over the last slide, but I'll, I remember it. One, it's, it's about compliance and auditing. Uh, not sexy, but it's a big deal. You know, what is that? I think the, the slide Christian put there is, is what your lack of faith in auditing is disturbing with Darth Vader. And actually, you know, to a, an investor lender, that's true. You know, at the end of the day, our um, investments are only good as the collateral underneath it, you know, be it home loans, be it construction loans. You know, we want to make sure that those are being originated, you know, into the standards that people said they are. And, you know, typically... Uh, good credit firms you know, that invest in these will have auditors going in and reviewing people's portfolio and their origination process and their servicing process and making sure they're doing everything they say they're supposed to. Uh, at times it's painful, but we don't have the kind of collateral you guys you know, have in, in crypto where an ETH is an ETH and you know what it's worth. Uh, if it's a home loan, we got to make sure you know, it was originated the right way and the government's not going to say, go away. You know, this is not valid. It's things like that. So compliance, um, finance is an important one. Let me touch on this a bit in terms of one, you know, we want to see uh, that the firm, the originator has a uh, sufficient liquidity, you know, in funding. We prefer companies, you know, that, that are cash flow positive. So they're not going back to investors. If they're not cash flow positive, you know, we're going to want to see a fair amount of cushion there. You know, we don't want to take a risk that they don't get funded their next round and then our assets go bad. You know, that, that that's not a great risk for us. Um, you know, we'll typically, you know, want to understand fairly well how their business is going. And we'll ask for like a three-year month, monthly operating model to show us, you know, how they're doing, where their funding has come from, things like this. Um, you know, just you want to understand that whoever is originating your assets 
and servicing them is going to be with you in the long term as long as your assets are at risk. And then finally, around legal, legal and regulatory here is important. We want to under we don't want to take a lot of legal risk around you know the lending relationships. So you know we would want to understand what are the regulatory regimes you know the different lending platforms you know operate in. You know is there a risk around how they're lending? You know, needless to say, I think we'd stay far away from you know high interest rates that start to appear. You know, what's the word? Usury. You know, when they start going above being when people are getting cute to try to charge higher rates than they're legally supposed to in a given domicile. I, I, I mean, I don't think Maker would want to do it anyway on, on ethical principles, but around just general good lending principles, you don't want to take much regulatory risk. You know, often when you get into regulatory trouble, it can be very painful and very expensive. Okay. Um, asset management, historical performance. So, you know, we've just talked about a whole bunch of the functions and trying to understand, you know, how the asset manager actually, you know, underwrites and manages the risk on their books. Now we will typically want to understand, you know, how their track record is gone. You know, if they've been around, you know, five or 10 years, and we'd love to see monthly returns you know, at the individual investment and at the fund level to understand, you know, how their underwriting is gone. You know, in a sense, we're just, it's, it's like, you're looking at, I don't want to say baseball, but that's not a good analogy. You're looking at someone's performance and trying to see, you know, how they done historically and why have they done well in some areas and, you know, and not as well in under areas. You know, we're going to want to see the gross and net returns. We're going to want to understand if they use leverage, uh, you know, use debt against it to make higher returns. And then we're typically going to try to find a reasonable benchmark that's similar to them. So, you know, how have, how have they done against other asset managers managing similar assets? You know, you could probably argue we don't want to be with an asset manager, you know, who's consistently the bottom quartile of the group that he operates within. You know, that's, that's typically not a great place to be. Uh, sorry, so I get this to go. What is all right? Transaction financial structure. All right, let's get more into the weeds. We don't have a lot of time, but I'll, I'll I'll at least try to hit some of the highlights. So when you look at the actual structure someone proposes to us, you know, this is when they're pitching a proposal. Um, what is it? It's essentially it's going to be the assets to go into it. Uh, what are the requirements around the assets? And then, you know, who's getting paid when and how? I mean, it's basically, it's just, it's a structure where we're taking risk and hopefully getting better returns than what we're putting in. Uh, those are the three parts. Let's talk a little more about each one. Um, so <laughs> here's South Park, but uh, we uh, early on want to see a transaction diagram. You know, this is a key thing. I mean, it's only one page typically, but it shows, and I'll show a few examples, you know, exactly how the thing's being set up how collateral and funds move across all the different parties. You know, usually to get these things done reasonably well, um, you're gonna have to have good outside counsel you know, to really you know, weigh in on what's legally sensible and what's not. You know, I, if anyone's thinking about being a manager, I would strongly encourage you to get good counsel putting these kind of things together. Uh, then there's gonna be a priority of payments that just kind of tells how the funds are being paid out of the structure. When do we get paid? <laughs> And then we're going to care a lot about uh, collateral and account control. So when collateral goes in, you know, be it um, home loans, uh, how's it validated? You know, they're good ones. You know, is there an auditing going on? Uh, and can we get control around the underlying collateral if we have to? I mean, we need to be, you know, we, we hope we don't have to, but if things go ugly, we want to be able to grab the, uh, the collateral and do what we need to. And then again, you know, the cash and the payment system uh, need to be very solid and something, you know, that's well within our control. Our slide here, uh, Wouter, I think this is for you, but anyone seen South Park? Uh, there's an example where one of the kids gets a $100 check for Christmas, goes to the bank to invest it, and the guy invests it and says, oh, let's put it in this currency hedged account, and it's gone. And the kid's like, why do you go? Oh, yeah, sorry, it's gone. You know, bad investment. Maker does not want to be in that situation, right? We, we want to be very careful where we're putting our funds. Here is a tra transaction diagram. This is pretty similar to what, I, I, in fact, I just cripped it from Christian's earlier one. Um, you know, when we say a, a transaction diagram, this is roughly what we mean, you know, showing how the, the assets are coming in, how the funds move, how the uh, liabilities, you know, the debt is being issued against the structure. You know, we, we want these to be well thought out. Priority of payments. This is, it's uh, also called a waterfall. What is this? Um, at a high level, you know, so here's the asset pool. Again, say it's home loans. 
you know, every, you know, every month, you know, a couple million dollars could be of principal and interest could be gathering up there. Um, it's going to be under the control of the SPV issuer, you know, in, in some kind of bank account that's controlled by the SPV. Then the deal structure, part of the deal structure is going to uh, allocate how these funds uh, every month, there's typically monthly payments are going to be paid. There's a very precise thing called a priority of payments or a waterfall and typically how they're allocated. Senior expenses come first, you know, like trustee, service, or auditor, uh, hedging costs. And actually, you typically want this as the lender because most of this is making sure that your assets are being taken care of. You know, if you don't have a servicer and no one's collecting payments, you're in a really bad situation. So it actually makes sense within reasonable levels, the senior expenses come first. Then typically the senior bonds, uh, you know, if, if we're going to be the senior secured lender, then we will come there. Then there will be the junior bonds if there's, you know, bonds under us. Then often there'll be some level of expenses that if they exceed some cap that you've already agreed upon, they will be paid next. And then finally, the funds left over will uh, eventually go to the equity first loss. You know, typically the originators will hold that piece. Uh, but as you can see there at the bottom of the waterfall, the idea here is they're very motivated to make sure everything's going well so the funds come to them. I will note there's many, many, many variations of waterfalls. You know, they all have this kind of general principle, but there's tons of nuances. Like for one example, I think an important example, after an event of default, when things go very bad, typically the junior bonds are going to be shut out. So then, you know, all the money just goes to the senior expenses into the senior bonds until the senior bonds are fully paid off. That's a risk mitigant. You know, structured finance has a lot of ways to try to mitigate risk when things go, when things go sideways. All right. Transaction financial structure. Um, uh, Please, Eric. Just um, just a note. Just a note. We've got, I think, uh, six. Very minutes few minutes left. time left. Yeah. And I think we've got still a few. Yeah, just just a few. Um, questions. Just a Should few we just do questions at this point? I mean, if there's a I, six of one, half a dozen of another. We we do have another call, I believe, um, with many of the same people on this call. So maybe we can go a few minutes over time. Okay. But uh, I'll try yeah, to go. For the people who, who do need to drop off and still want to get their question in, uh, please put it in chat and uh, we'll make sure to get to it before uh, the, the top of the hour. Sure. Yeah, and while, while we get the questions, I just wanted to say something to conclude this, on my side at least, is it seems a lot of work and it, it is a lot of work, but our ambition here is to step up the game, educate the counterparties, and show the counterparties out there that they shouldn't they shouldn't approach maker because it's it's a not so smart source of liquidity but because it's a huge source of liquidity at competitive pricing and um, but they should be as professional as as institutional as they come and hopefully uh, after the first painful period people out there they will they will appreciate their competitive advantage of makers a source of liquidity and uh, and align along those expectations that we have so the first the first collateral applications and the first um, the first reviews the risk report risk reports that the core unit will provide are crucial in setting those standards and hopefully later those will be will be accepted by the community and there will not be so much work because the stuff we receive is of the quality we expect and we do have a question about, um, I guess, the connection to DAI as, as clean money. Uh, are climate criteria a factor at all in this framework? That's a good question. I mean, it, it's a community priority. So I, I think it's something that we would be quite aware of. And the community is going to have to decide how much they want to like potentially relax standards if, if they need to to do it. I think that's an ongoing discussion. Will, do you... Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll quickly jump jump into this one. So this is something that has has come up um, in um, in uh, one or two projects that actually were directly climate climate related, and we know that there is a number of um, ESG frameworks out there. Some of them more solid than others. So at the moment, what we are doing, we're uh, we're doing some research on some of those different frameworks. The same as for this um, methodology. To try to embed some uh, some of those learnings 
into um, into this review framework, but um, this is still actually pending because at the moment we, we haven't really received a ton of um, applications that are um, directly uh, related uh, to ESG um, yet, but these are starting to come. Very good. So I'll see what I can get through. Um, so when you think about a, a financial uh, structure, what's there? Credit enhancements is an important part. Basically, it's saying if the deal doesn't perform particularly well and there's losses on the underlying collateral, i.e. it's paying less than anticipated, how much, um, how much capital is underneath us that takes the losses before we ever do? Now, this is a big deal. Um, typically, you know, most of this protection is subordination and over collateralization. I'll show an example, but it means like bonds, you know, and, and like kind of equity underneath you. So it essentially means if there's $100 of collateral, maybe we've loaned the first 70 cents against it. Someone else is owning the bottom 30 cents and the losses go to the bottom 30% before we ever feel the first one. Very important. You know, there's some excess spread. There's some other things. I'll just leave it alone for time. And then performance triggers. Again, when I say things don't go well and then we're protected, but like, what does that mean? Um, you know, how do we help mitigate that risk? You know, typically you're going to have a lot of triggers thoughtfully set around one, like how the assets are performing. Again, if it's, if it's auto loans, you know, if you get too many delinquencies, um, that could, you know, essentially shut down. If, if it's a revolving facility, there'll be new, no new loans. It could shut down the, the junior bonds and only we, the senior bond, gets all of the cash. Uh, same with defaults. You get too many defaults over time. Cash shortfalls, same thing. And under collateralization, which is just another way of, of you know, the thing not going well. And then, you know, it's, it's going to, um, you know, kind of redirect cash to us at the senior position. And if it's revolving, shut it down. At the end of the day, you want to do good deals and you don't want to rely on your triggers, but they are there to mitigate risk, you know, if things are going poorly. And if they're well thought out, they should make a difference. Let's see. Um, here's a uh, credit enhancement. Here's an example. Uh, I have to admit, it, it, this is a bit painful, but to, if you want to get what credit enhancement uh, is, bear with me uh, on this simple example. So an originator sells an asset pool for $100 to the SPV. Uh, what, well, what does the SPV do? The SPV sells a senior bond for 80, uh, John, um, I apologize, it's the senior bond for 70, my bad. So the 70 right here, so they sell a senior bond to us, they sell a junior bond to another investor. Um, and then the equity piece typically required goes back to the originator. So they're in the first loss piece. So $100 has been put into the structure, the SPV, and $100 of li $100 has been allocated. But you'll note there's only $85 of total liabilities, right? L let me flip, I'll go to the next page. But you'll note that there's less liabilities than there are assets. That's a form of protection to the liabilities, the bondholders. So if we flip this over, same basic situation. I'm just looking really much at the liabilities. So we're at 70%, right? That's, that's say that's maker. There's another guy at 15% who's in the first loss or who's subordinated to us. He'll take losses before we do. Then you've got the first loss position, typically the originator. Note also, I said that there's 85, uh, there's only $85 of actual bonds or liabilities. This extra $15 of, of collateral beyond the, the debt values called the over collateralization, it's just how much collateral exceeds the uh, outstanding value of, of the debt. I hope that makes sense. So here's 15% uh, protection to both the junior and the senior bonds. That's over collateralization. For the senior bond, not only does he have the 15% of the first loss piece, he's also got the junior bond. The junior bond is going to take all the losses until it's gone before the senior bond will take a loss. So in essence, the senior bond has 30% credit support. I, I made the senior bond in green here to basically say, we're looking in this from the senior bond maker's perspective, where we 30% of the collateral has to blow up before we start taking losses. And it's a mixture of the junior bond, which is subordinated to us, and then the over collateralization, which is just more collateralization than you have outstanding debt in the, in the structure. This is a key point. I would definitely, you know, if people want to understand structured finance, these are a couple of these things are the hearts of it. All right. Um, financial, financial uh, transaction. Didn't we just, uh, all right. 
financial covenants. So not only will we have covenants around the asset performance, you know, the pool of, of uh, credit cards, if they don't go well, we want the structure to protect the senior lender, us. We also typically are going to want financial covenants around the asset manager. You know, they have to have enough money to, you know, to be paying their people to do a good job. Um, you know, underneath them, uh, the originators, you know, the asset managers go want the originators, you know, creating the loans, you know, to be operating well. They go financial covenants on them and the servicers as well. So this could be a whole bunch of kind of different levels of financial covenants to make sure everyone that's involved managing the assets uh, needs to be there to do, you know, do their function. So there, you know, there has to be, you know, financial health and various things like that. And you can see key man, you know, if someone's really important to a business and they leave, you, know, you might have an event to help shut down risk at that point. Uh, and then one of the other things we definitely will look to with the asset manager is if, you know, if they do something, you know, if things don't go well and they get in trouble, what's the transition plan? You know, we're not going to come in and run their business. You know, that's not our skill set. You know, we're passive. Uh, but what's a reasonable transition plan, you know, in place uh, that's going to help us get out of a tough situation? All right, the asset base. We've talked a lot about the structure, you know, how, how risk is, is, is allocated and paid and mitigated. What about the underlying pool of assets, um, you know, that we actually rely to get paid on from? First, as I said, it's a big deal, whether it's, it's a one-time pool, you put in a bunch of 30-year mortgages and we make a loan against it and no more collateral versus a revolving one. You know, when I said a credit card pool where maybe every month they keep putting in more loans and we extend more funds. Um, generally, a revolving pool is a lot more work. <laughs> and then so at, at, the, um, at the fund level and at the investment level, we, we wanna understand how, how people um, you know, are, are doing this. You know, how do they do their investments? Right? How do they invest in their individual deals and how do they manage the overall fund you know, with the whole group of deals? You know, that's a big deal. And it's gonna be things like the eligibility criteria. You know, what ass assets are allowable you know, at, at the deal and at the fund level? And there's also gonna be you know, issues and questions like what are the concentration limits? If it's a fund, you know, should you have more than 20% of it being energy related businesses? You know, being a senior lender, we typically wanna see a lot of diversification. So if one industry goes to hell, you know, we don't get sucked down. So you're always trying to keep things well diversified, so to speak, and, and do the best you can. You don't want to be like this picture, right? Where all the risk wound up in one portfolio, i.e. ours. <laughs> Let's see. All right. <laughs> and then as part of the asset base, um, we want to understand and get confidence that the asset manager and potentially the, the guys, you know, running the uh, originators under them, they really know how their assets are going to perform. You know, they have sharp sense of how it should perform in a normal environment, you know, how it might perform in a stressed, you know, recession environment, you know, where they're going to get in trouble. You know, so we, we want to see that they're, you know, making very thoughtful asset performance projections that are based on history, you know, and some intuition on what's coming. You know, if we look at someone's portfolio and we're able to make a better, you know, forecast of their performance over the next two years, that's a bad sign, right? They need to be the experts in the assets and really be, you know, all over their assets, you know, and when do they update these performances? You know, how much, you know, how do they track the realized performance of a given pool versus the expected? And when do they know there's a problem? Um, you know, and as part of this, when you're, they're forecasting this out in these, these uh, assumptions, we want to understand the underlying, like the key drivers in how assets perform. And these are you know, typically loans. So we're going to want to understand what kind of assumptions they're making around default and prepayment, you know, the curves over time that say how these phase in, um, you know, what are the asset subgroups? I mean, if you have a credit card portfolio, do you assume everyone's the same credit and behaves the same, or do you have, you know, several different types, you know, riskier and less risky, you know, and modeling them separate? Um, you know, and then we're also going to care if there's interest rate and or currency uh, rate exposure to maker, you know, how, how are you, um, how are you modeling that and how are you managing it? And I believe that's pretty much the end of the line, right, Christian? Let's check. Yeah, I think so. And I will say the, this really is the four horsemen of the risk apocalypse. Too much debt, bad valuations, too concentrated, and no one there to buy your assets when you're in trouble. Yeah, all right. So this is yeah, just the appendix. So thanks, folks. I think uh, we went over. Apologies. Yes, we want to take questions or just move on, gentlemen. 
Yeah, uh, thanks, Eric and uh, Christian for the yeah, the very uh, extensive overview and the, the explanations. Um, so I put in chat, maybe we can go 15 minutes over just to allow for um, additional questions if there are any. To, uh, to get us kicked off, maybe I, I have a question which um, relates to uh, the, um, the structure of the DAO, right? Yeah. Uh, so as you, uh, as you clearly laid out, um, a DAO is, is, uh, is probably a, a pretty passive player and we want to scale this up. So uh, naturally there would be a low risk appetite and we, we want to uh, learn as many lessons as we can from uh, the, the traditional finance industry to make sure that uh, we, uh, we get this right. Uh, on the other hand, DAOs are also supposed to be more open organizations that allow for um, a degree of innovation. Do you see these two as, as conflicting or um, do you see a world where the, the two can, can kind of coexist? I'll give you my two cents. I'm sure I'm not the only view. I say there is a natural conflict, let's be honest. But when I think about this, I think we want to innovate. I think it's very important to innovate around process, um, you know, openness, things like that. You know, traditional finance, there's a lot of problems around it. So. You know, what can DeFi and blockchain really do? Um, you know, better processes, more transparency. We should always be leaning that way. And then I'll say when we do innovation, if it, it looks like it's creating more risk uh, you know, to the actual asset performance, I think, it's, I think it's something the makers should potentially do, but I think we need to size that very carefully. You know, when you're looking at potentially you know, bad returns for taking an innovation, how, how big a risk do you want to take there? My view is that's where you keep the size manageable. When you're putting out serious dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars plus, you know, in my view, that needs to be really you know, kind of bulletproof investments, you know, very safe. I wouldn't want it to, maybe it could be a more innovative process around titling a mortgage, but I wouldn't want to take innovative credit risk unless you really understand it. Because I think Christian and I would kind of laugh. We want to be innovative in all areas, except finding new, creative, innovative ways to lose money. I don't think that's a good idea. Yeah, um, I guess let, let me jump on on this one. Actually, give a little bit like flavor of where 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 we're coming from and where I guess we are going. Right. So, um, I think in these, I guess in the experimentation that I, um, uh, real world financing has been for for the team since its beginning. Um, we started. We started with the innovation first and figuring out how to do the financial plumbing, um, I guess, um, later proper, properly. So that was kind of like the very first phase of what we're doing. That's why we did a lot of experimentation uh, with, um, with a number of projects actually, uh, particularly in the early parts of uh, last year. But then as time went on, I say like, okay, but this probably as, as Eric was alluded to, it doesn't it doesn't scale as as well. And we're doing innovation, but there's a lot of you know patching that we have to do along the way. So at the end of the day, the innovation that is that is great at the beginning, then actually you spend a whole bunch of time operationally trying to patch things up because they were not bulletproof for scaling. Um, so in this so we what we are doing in the moment is kind of like flipping a little bit the problem in its head and saying, okay, let's um, let's do first something properly done, kind of like proper secretization in this um, in this um, this presentation kind of really laid, laid out those 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 um, those those principles. And then when when we do that, we are gonna find doing that proper secretization in what ways that we can actually innovate. Right? We are gonna identify what are the gaps in there. Or like, for example, from a governance standpoint, how governance actually interacts with uh, with this kind of parties and so on, and let's innovate there, and then and then and then we are going to take other steps like what uh, uh, Eric was alluding to in terms of mortgages. Okay, can actually those mortgages actually be natively kind of issued on chain? Uh, great. Okay, so we can actually innovate that, that we have covered the basics of the financial pounding underneath. So that actually you just kind of you build a good foundation, then you can build, you know, um, a few good houses on top of it. If the foundation is is 
is not appropriate, then it's going to be much harder for us actually to build houses or cities on top of it. Right? So, so that's the direction that we're going. Yeah. The, sorry, guys, I had to step out like two minutes for a call, and I think there was a question. I'll um, I'll try to reply super quickly given the interest of time. So, I think we can reconcile the low risk appetite with the innovative nature of a DAO, because I think uh, we can be innovative, but being solid with the credit quality. Now, um, at the same time, we need, to, we, need, we need to maintain some kind of balance because if we go, for example, out there and we have super strict requirements and we require very institutionalized conversations, obviously we'll, we will always prefer big, uh, big well-founded traditional parties because they have done this job for much longer and they're much bigger, there are a lot of, a lot of capital and that will trump all the all the most innovative startup uh, startup environments out there, which is not which is not within the mandate of maker. So I think um, we can definitely work at the same time as we've been doing so far with smaller firms closer to the community that are ramping up their business. But obviously, this this demands that we set the expectations on both sides. What does it mean? First of all. Obviously, we would feel much more comfortable to underwrite and provide hundreds of millions of capital to uh, big companies like a Goldman Sachs of this world uh, than a very small company without track record. So a small company that wants to grow alongside Maker will need to start from a smaller ask because obviously we have less to underwrite. On the other hand, this will require work on our side. So I think if the community wants real world finance to work side by side with a, with a startup that is growing, then the community will need to understand that there will be costs involved because we will have to dedicate a part, a part of, a, of, a, of, a, of a resource or one FTE or more to work very closely with those, with those uh, companies because they need to grow and mature. Obviously, if we work with a very institutionalized um, counterparty like Societe Generale, we have nothing to cheat teach them. We just need to find a good, a good balance. So I think we will try to keep this balance, but it will require compromises on both sides in terms of costs for the costs for the or for MakerDAO in terms of resources to dedicate and amount of financing that we are comfortable in giving at day zero to a company that, that doesn't have such a deep track record. It's a difficult task, but it's something that we are aiming at doing. Yes, the other thing I'll say, if I jump in, uh, you know, hopefully we're gonna close this SOC Gen tokenization deal uh, in, the next, in the next two months. I mean, so th there's actually innovation available too with some of the big parties. You know, so I mean, it, it's, I, I think we should be open to the small guys, but also you know, there's some big guys that really wanna start doing inter interesting things. And the other point I make is SOC Gen, you know, it's coming to us, I think for a 20 million, $30 million loan, in their mind, they're innovating. This is, this is a proof of concept. You know, so they don't start big either. You know, people who want to do interesting new stuff typically start smaller. So if you miss, you miss small. And then as, as you build confidence, you, know, you start growing over time. So, I mean, I think it's interesting even SockGen, you know, starts pretty small with how they want to do this. Yes, uh, thank you, Eric. Um, we'll take, uh, as a last question, the one from chat. So uh, Max is asking, MakerDAO can lend with arbitrary terms. The DAO is not bound to Basel III. <laughs> Does uh, Real World Finance and Sandbox look to Basel III as the guide, or is it uh, strategic for MakerDAO to lend to asset classes like trade finance and project finance that Basel restricts? So, yeah. um, so uh, Luca, let me let me answer the yes. project finance. Let me answer the project finance one because that's <laughs> principally that, that that that's my expertise. Um, you know, I'd love to do more project finance um, with with Maker because it it does have the ability, as you correctly point out, Max, to not be restricted. Project finance, in some sense, is a lot more complicated, a lot more difficult. Um, simply because you are, it requires a hell of a lot more due, due diligence. I mean, you really have to understand the project. And most developers are looking for um, longer term capital. So, you know, most projects are looking for, you know, in the US, it's very short, it's seven. But if you go outside the US, it's 15 year terms. And I'm just not sure Maker is ready for that yet. 
Um, the other thing that would be interesting is whether whether Maker could participate uh, as a as a participant in a in a larger deal. So you know you have one of the bigger banks that is selling a participation, or you know I, I worked on the Mozambique LNG project on the financing side for a number of years. You know piggyback on the work that all the large international commercial banks are doing and take a slug for $500 million simply because we can. And you know that you're relying on the work that others are doing. That would actually be very interesting. I think it's just gonna be, that's probably going to be a, a bit further down the road, at least on the project finance side. And if I can add, because of the, um, Max refers to the Sandbox project, and I think I, com I can combine Max's and Louise's question here. I mean, Basel III doesn't, doesn't, restrict, doesn't restrict, restrict pretty much anything. What Basel III does is making sure that for certain activities, there is a capital in the bank backing the risks and that certain loopholes that were before used to uh, cancel or hide these risks in the balance sheet don't happen. And Basel III is very complicated. It's a very complex uh, complex. Uh, um, uh, set of guidelines ever evolving and we have no intention to we have no intention to um, to mimic Basel 3 also because Basel 3 is a very complex set of, set of requirements for a bank mainly because a bank takes deposits from investors and deposits are protected by the central bank now at the same time banks are not stupid as Christian said, I've done, the banks have done this work for many years. So we should learn from the activity of, from the activities that banks have done and from the risk, uh, from the risk management, um, from the risk management practices. Now, the, the last one is, for Luis, difference between providing capital and being investor. There is no difference. I think we can provide capital through any possible structure. We can provide capital to, a, to an asset manager, giving a loan to an asset manager, we can provide capital to an asset manager being an investor in their fund. We can provide capital buying a securitization. We can provide capital in any way. The most important way is we are agnostic and we try to make sure that the quality of the credit that we are onboarding is consistent with Eric's, the, the, the criteria that Eric's, uh, Eric's outlined so in, in, such, in so much detail. Uh, anything, any structure it works. We just need to make sure that the structure is the right one. And hopefully in the medium term, those structures will standardize and hopefully go on chain. Okay, great. Thank you, Luca, for uh, the answer. Um, so we'll conclude here. Uh, thanks, Christian, Eric, uh, Luca, Will, for um, the presentation and the discussion. We'll make the recording available. And of course, the, uh, uh, the questions and answers, they can continue on the forum thread that has also been created. And uh, thanks, everyone, for joining. We'll see you next time. Thank, Thank you. you.